importance of the branch and also uh, give an update on the annual report which has been submitted to the national secretariat which was quite um, uh, warmly was received uh, so without much ado i, I want to stop and um, invite um, um, dr akili to read the citation of the of our speaker and we'll, we'll all listen to him thank you very much thank you very much mr mr chairman um yes i'll just stop sharing now so um just you may have i hope everyone saw the message that was um prompted with regards to recording. Um, I didn't announce because there was an embedded um, permission request. So I'm assuming everyone is happy for us to record this. And if you're not, please, um, you can um, you can switch off your, your video. So um, yes, thank you very much. I'll proceed with um, the introduction now. Our topic for today is safety in the in 21st century the place of engineers in the puzzle as you would all recall our theme for this um, quarter which is the last quarter for the year is safety health and environment and this would be the the third um, the third lecture within this theme now our speaker for today is um Mi Abe Adeogun. sorry permit me if i've made any mistakes with the pronunciation of any of the names who graduated from the University of Lagos with a first class in mechanical engineering and later got his master's in mechanical engineering from the same university. Abe furthered his passion on health and safety by obtaining master's in occupational safety and health from Columbia Southern University, the United States, and later an MBA on health and safety leadership from the University of Frederick Fredericton, in Canada. Um, Abe started his career with John Holt as service engineer slash safety officer, where he led many technicians in providing excellent safe service in HVAC systems. By that, I'm assuming it's a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning installation to oil and gas clients. He later moved to Chevron, Nigeria, as loss prevention engineer and grew with increasing responsibilities till he voluntarily resigned after 15 years of meritorious career. At Chevron, he led the efforts on hazard slash risk assessment, operations and project support. Um, Abbey joined Husky, now Senovos Energy in Canada, as senior safety advisor and left the organization as safety specialist after seven years of service. At Husky, he championed the development and implementation of safety programs, such as office safety program, life-saving rules, human factors, and technical standards. He co-authored data-driven updates to industry life-saving rules. And the link, a link to that, um, publication is available, which we'll shared out through the chat after, after this um, um, citation. Abe is currently with Saudi Aramco as field compliance coordinator, and he hopes to make positive impacts as he combines his engineering knowledge with his safety experiences over the years. So uh, Mr. Adeogun, uh, thank you very much for honoring our invitation, and um, we're ready to listen to your talk when you are. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Engineer Akelu. Um, I'm really glad to be here. And uh, just uh, want to share my screen if I have the uh, co host right. Uh, I think you should be fine. Yeah. Okay. And um, I really want to uh, appreciate my. Um, I want to share the other screen, not this no. one. So if you go to, can you see display settings at the top? Yeah. Click on display settings, the, the chevron there, just the drop down arrow. Okay. Yeah, then this click one? on duplicate slide below, duplicate slide. Yeah. No, can you see? Okay. Duplicate? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I really want it to be in a presentation format. Uh, not uh, duplicating. So, but if you go on 
presenter mode, then we will all be seeing it as presenter mode as well. Where is the presenter mode this? So if you go back to where you were. Um, um, because if you, if, if you remain in the other mode, then we'll be seeing it exactly the way you're seeing it as well, if you understand what yeah, I mean. But I want the presenter mode so that uh, I have my speaker notes that I can use. So uh, that's one reason. Uh, okay, try sharing again, let's see. So I'm still in a kind of- Yeah, so, mode. Yeah, so you need to do, you, you you can do that, you can only do that from your own side now. Um, so if you go back to, because I, I, I can't see your, I don't, have <laughs> so access, I, I don't have access to your PowerPoint from here. So, um, but if you- um, You know, how can I exit this uh, duplicating my so, screen? So if you stop sharing. Stop sharing. Um, now, I don't know what kind of, um, now it, it's a function of your version and what you have, so. Mm. So, uh, because I, I am in that uh, mode of um, duplicating my uh, screen, which I said, uh, I want to exit that mode so that I can have another screen. I have double screen here. So I can use one screen for mm. presentation while the presentation is on another one. Mm. Um, how do I do that? Because uh, it's, uh, it's not giving me that many of, uh, Leaving the uh, um, let me see, just if I just take a few seconds, supposed to uh, hmm. I think you need to click on just when you're sharing the screen, just um, select the your presentation, just click on just your presentation, okay. Yeah. Um, so so stop because sharing. like uh, yeah, stop stop sharing. sharing. Then when you're sharing, just highlight the your presentation, the windows, the window where your presentation is. And <clears throat> okay. So uh, so presenting. And then uh, where's my, I still film here, yes, this... sorry about this, uh, I'm not a tech guru like that, uh, okay, um, I want to share this screen. Mm -hmm. So are you seeing my screen now? No, have you, the window where you need to share, have you clicked yeah. on it? So, well, what me, screen are you seeing now? It's doing like a loading stuff. So there's just this thing loading. You're, you've started sharing your screen, but I don't know why we can't say it, it's just loading. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, it's a uh, tech tech issue sometimes. Um, I've I've tested this so many times that uh, even um, I mean I, I know it works until I do the. I'm sharing my screen again. Uh, I don't know why. Can you see my screen now? Yes. 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 Uh, but is it on presentation format at your end? Yes, yeah, it's it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, really sorry about the delay. Uh, okay. Uh, let's just uh, go ahead and then we'll. Uh, so just we'll just one more thing. Can you see? Can you see anything like monitors group at your side? It's not giving me that option. Okay, it's just giving me that option now. Aha. Uh -huh. So 
Um, so you can see my. Uh... Yes, we can. Okay. We can. It's fine now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, that's okay then. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the good introduction. And uh, uh, I know I have a few minutes, uh, about 40 minutes to present with this initial issue. Maybe that has reduced. Now you have 35. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your generosity. So um, I, I want to thank uh, my friend and uh, classmates, uh, Camille Okidara, who uh, reached out to me to say, okay, if we have this, uh, um, the UK branch of NSC, would I want to present on safety? And I said, why not? So um, thank you so much for the invitation and I'm glad to be here. So let's, uh, talk about safety. And um, I want to start by uh, using one quote from Sir Brian Appleton. Many of us may know him in the UK. And he says, safety is not an intellectual exercise to keep us in work. It is a matter of life and death. It is the sum of our contribution to safety management that determines whether the people we work with live or die. So everything we do as engineers can contribute to somebody living or somebody dying. So that's that's the way, uh, I mean, he has defined define it. And uh, I want to believe that uh, we would um, see where we make that contribution shortly. Uh, I'll be covering just this, what you are seeing on your screen, uh, just quick reflection on Dr. Mother's uh, um, presentation last month, and then what is risk assessment and how is that concerned with safety? Uh, my focus here today really is on process safety, and I will make that uh, a distinction very shortly. And um, engineering safety by design, where do we connect? How can we help? Uh, I'll be sharing that shortly too. Um, maybe possibly you have heard about safety professionals. What do they do? And how can they help us as engineers? I will share their scope of, uh, uh, their, uh, I mean, their scope and functions uh, just on one slide. And the last, but not the least is to see where can you help. So I'm going to go through this uh, as, short, as quickly as possible. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, we understand the basis. So I just want to share this slide of definition so that we are all on the same page. Um, the basis of any safety professional and any safety work is to uh, know what hazards are. And as you can see on your screen, hazards are workplace conditions or workers' action, not just the condition, but workers' action that can result in injury, illnesses, or other organizational losses. Now, you need to have the hazard, then can do risk assessment. And the risk is uh, defined as a measure of probability and severity of a loss. So you have defined the hazard, you know what the risk is, and then, then you want to put that in a safety context. For you to say safety, you need to have an acceptable or low probability of risk associated with the condition or the activities that can have the potential to harm somebody. And uh, you know, and we look at safety from two lenses, the uh, loss prevention or loss control. And as you can see on your screen, we want to make sure that we are on that proactive side of uh, safety, where we define, we, we, we design a program to identify and correct potential accident problems before they result in financial loss. We want to be proactive. That is a loss prevention opportunity. But loss control, uh, even when we have all the loss prevention issues, loss control is something we have to make sure that the impact 
of any issue or incident is reduced. We want to make sure that uh, we have emergency response plan in place so that uh, the, the, the consequence that we may have as a result of any event uh, is reduced to barest minimum. But safety management is so is the encompasses the responsibility of planning, organizing, leading, and controlling activities necessary to achieve an organization loss prevention and loss control goals. I believe many of us we are working for organization or we are by ourselves doing consultancy. And I want to uh, make sure that we understand when we say uh, safety management. And safety in design, which is more critical to us as engineers, is uh, to really make sure that uh, we incorporate safety in the design of facilities and workplaces. But I'm very sure that where you are sitting now, you are very comfortable. You have look at the low probability of any event taking place at the place you are sitting currently. And you think that that place has been designed for you not to have any issue. And that's why that low probability gave you the confidence of staying in that environment. You know? So safety in design is critical uh, in designing facilities and uh, workplaces. And as I said, I will talk more about safety professional later, but uh, they, they concern themselves with el elimination of uh, elimination of control of hazards. Hazard is fundamental to every safety work. And we will see that shortly. So uh, I just thought I should put this uh, in place. Uh, Dr. Mothers talk about uh, safe work in the 21st centuries. Last month, I happened to attend and it focused majorly on occupational health and safety. And uh, I will just try to make a difference. What is the difference between occupational health, occupational safety, and process safety? Let's quickly go through that because possibly you must have had those uh, terms before. So occupational safety, I mean, somehow sometimes we use that uh, broad, as uh, uh, word safety to mean these three things, even the four things on your screen. Occupational health, we need to know what I mean. That focuses more on efficient functioning of individuals. And uh, the attention is on health hazards. More often, the health effect of occupational health is chronic, it's not something immediate. You, you don't see it quickly. If you are working with asbestos, for example, you might be exposed to asbestos if you are not using proper PPE, but the, the effect will be in 10 years, 20 years time, when you begin to develop the issues related to that. That is what is called chronic. And then the health hazards are not very easy to, to identify. That is why you have specialists in those areas. And those specialists are called uh, uh, industrial hygienists. Maybe you have heard about such names before, but they are also part of that pool of safety professional. The other one I want to point out now is occupational health. Occupational health deals with low likelihood and high, uh, I mean, low likelihood, uh, I mean, high likelihood and low consequence events. Uh, sleep, trip, and fall, falling from heights. Uh, maybe vehicular accidents. Those are all things that happen frequently, but their consequences are very, very, uh, very low. It protects worker, and then uh, it's quite less expensive to implement uh, occupational health uh, strategies, occupational safety, sorry, occupational safety strategies. We can actually collect and, uh, and um, data very easily on occupational safety issues. I break my hand, it is recorded. I, I lost uh, my eyes, it is recorded to one person, to two people, and that is what occupational safety is all about. Uh, the career part here, I, they, they call them safety professional, but at the end of the day, it can enclose or encompass all these that you are seeing on the screen. The last one I really uh, focus tonight is on process safety. This deals with low likelihood, high consequence events. And uh, you will see shortly when I uh, begin to zero in on that. It takes human environment and business into consideration and is quite expensive to implement. 
when you destroy the design, a process facility, you really want to make sure that uh, that process facility is well designed not to have the catastrophic event, uh, event uh, when they start the operation. And uh, I mean, some people in some organizations, they call the, the career path process safety engineer. And, but that is also under the umbrella of a safety professional. When I was working with uh, Chevron, um, I mean, it, I was called health, environment and safety uh, professional there. Uh, I mean, looking at the spectrum of health, environment and safety um, activities. But my focus area is really on, uh, on safety. And um, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's one way to look at it well from your professional point of view. I will leave the environment side, but you can be very sure there are professionals that are focused is on environment and they, they have, they, they specialize in that area. So whenever you hear safety professional, it can be or across this, or it can be uh, just in a focus of all these uh, uh, areas that you are seeing on your screen. So let's move on to look at, uh, um, I mean, this example that I put here. On your left, you will see just a woman operating a lathe machine. All that you can have as event or incident from that is related to that one woman looking at that, whether those flying objects can, can fly to her eyes. I mean, that's just uh, one pet. Or the, 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 uh, the lathe machine had any uh, problem and uh, maybe he started her hand somewhere. But we can design this not to affect her uh, by putting some controls in place. But on your right, you see all those pipings and uh, uh, you really want to make sure that this is designed properly because any loss of containment in this uh, particular uh, process facility can either kill, I mean, uh, destroy the environment, uh, destroy the assets, as well as impact as many people as are around them. So you can see the difference between occupational safety and uh, process safety. It's really uh, between that um, low likelihood or high likelihood of uh, those events. So this is just to give us a pictorial uh, view of occupational safety and process safety. Um, the foundation of any professional or safety work is uh, in this, in the slide you are looking on your screen. Every safety, uh, either occupational, occupational health, occupational safety, process safety, environmental issues, start with these, uh, what we are seeing on the screen, hazard or risk assessment. And how do we do risk assessment? You need to identify the hazard first. When you identify the hazard, you determine who is going to be impacted by that hazard, and you assess, you do risk assessment, which is uh, a combination of how, 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 how likely this is going to happen and how bad can it be? You multiply the two to get a risk number. And when you get that as a risk assessment, you really want to have a risk matrix to define. You can see in that picture, that is a risk matrix on that. And you really want to say in our organization, what is our risk tolerance level? And you can begin to see where those assessment fall in. Just doing the assessment without having uh, an action in place to mitigate or control uh, what risk we have identified uh, is a useless exercise. So number four is talking about having action. You need to identify the action to eliminate or control that risk. And number five is talking about uh, making sure that your risk and your controls that you put in place are actually fun functioning properly. It is important for us to know that we have hazards all around us, like I mentioned before. Where you are now listening to me, you have determined that the safety of that place is good enough. That is why you are there. And uh, of course, we all drive vehicles. You have put it in place that that vehicle is good. I mean, you are driving on the road thinking that everything should be OK from point A to point B and back to point A. So, you, you have, we are doing those, those risk assessments in our mind and we have uh, determined that they are good enough. That's why we engage in them. But in a workplace, we really need to be, made, to be very sure that safety is actually taken care of. 
Where does engineer uh, come into this? Uh, we want to just quickly look at that. Uh, um, this uh, picture you are seeing on your screen is called, I told you about step four. You need to have, uh, uh, I mean, put a plan in place to eliminate or control. And we use this uh, uh, triangle as hierarchy of control. And you can see there is the most effective and there is the least effective. And if you look at it uh, from top to bottom, you will see we can have options of having controls that will eliminate or substitute. Take for a uh, chemical, chemical processing uh, plant, for example, they want to use a chemical and they understand that this chemical can easily uh, uh, affect people's functional ability over the years. And they all, okay, part of the control is to substitute, look for another chemical that will give the same uh, result, but less uh, impactful on people that are there. So we use this in order to gauge how our controls will be after doing our, our risk assessment. So you can see maybe in your organization, you have seen this before, but this is just the basis to which we design controls. You don't want to rely on PPE if you can have engineering control. If you can have engineering control, you want to isolate people uh, from that hazard. Another example I can give here is our generators. Uh, some generators are enclosed. Some generators are open. And the two of them have similar KVA. And when you open, put on the, uh, the open one, you hear so much noise. But in the, uh, in the uh, enclosed one, you will not even know that it is working. Noise control, isolating the hazard from people. So that's part of, uh, part of the design, engineering control we can do. And for, for administrative control, here in uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, the temperature can really go high to 50 degrees, 52 degrees. But there is a control in place here that whenever we have such temperature, people cannot stay outside more than 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, you need to enter an enclosure where you have AC, and after some time, you can go out again and then do another 30 minutes administrative controls. So these are all things that we put in place in order to manage the hazard or the risk that we have assessed with respect to our workplace, workplaces. So this is one uh, aspect of our tool in the toolbox of safety professional to actually see how we can manage the hazard we are exposed to. And uh, so quickly, let's look at an example of uh, one of those things that uh, the hierarchy of control that have been applied to. You can see fire and explosion control priorities. And in each stage, you will see how it has been incorporated. And if you look at uh, the engineering control itself, you see devices, protective uh, uh, safety design features that have been put in order for us to achieve fire and explosion control. This could be applied to anywhere, even in our, 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 our workplaces or in a kind of oil and gas facility. These are things that you need to review and make sure that you have it in place in order to make sure that uh, we don't have fire in that uh, environment. So um, this is, as I said, uh, hierarchy of controls. But let's look at another tool. And these tools, as I'm sharing with us, are mostly effective with engineers using these whenever they are designing uh, facilities or equipment or anything uh, whatsoever. This hierarchy of controls really is part of our toolbox that we can use as such uh, places. Another uh, tool is what we call bow tie. I'm sure maybe a few of us must have seen this before, but I want to draw your attention to the arrow here. And the logical flow for this uh, bow tie, if you look at it, is uh, uh, can the potential cause, if you can see my cursor, can this potential cause, can it create the, this event? And with this event, if it is created, can it create this consequence? And the, what that means is that if we remove these controls, uh, can this potential cause, can it create this event? And when this event is created, can it generate this consequence? If you have this mitigation and then control in place, for sure, uh, it is obvious that uh, we can prevent 
there are those, those events from happening. Just uh, to, to, to just give us an example, let's look at this example uh, of uh, driving in IC control, I mean, uh, losing control of our vehicles whenever we are driving. Now look at it, can IC, control, uh, IC road create a loss of control of car? I think the answer would be yes, if you don't have those controls in place. And can the loss of control result in a vehicle being destroyed? The answer would be yes, if you don't have those uh, mitigation in place. So we are saying this uh, bow tie is, is, is a very, very useful tool. And as engineers, I want to promote that to us to use it in our various uh, endeavor as a consultant or as a, as a, as a, a professional engineer in your day-to-day your -day activities. So if you look at it from the left to the right, you want to stay to the left as much as possible. But even at that, you still want to consider the right hand and making sure that you have that preparedness in place in case anything goes wrong. Another example here is uh, this one on, uh, on uh, drop objects. The hazard is drop objects. Now, like I mentioned before, can structural failure of that crane, can it create a drop object if you don't have those controls? And if this drop object is created, can it lead to personnel being hit by an object if you don't have those mitigation in place? So it's, it's just a, a kind of pictorial diagrammatic view of your hazards and what you can put in place in order to manage those hazards. And at the end of the day, we are seeing this as a, a, a good result in managing our, our workplaces and promoting safety in those workplaces. So um, I will go into process safety now. I believe you must be having your questions. Please post your questions and uh, we'll get through them as we uh, go through this presentation tonight. So let's zero in. I have gone through the fundamentals of any safety uh, uh, activity. You start from hazard, you identify, and then you risk assess, you put mitigation in place, and then you, uh, 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 you, you evaluate those, your mitigations or controls, whether they are effective or not. And I've also shared with us some tools that we can use in making sure that uh, uh, those uh, mitigations or the hazards are controlled. Here, we just want to quickly zero in on process safety and the definition, what is process safety, for example? Uh, it's a discipline framework for managing the integrity of hazardous operating system and processes by applying good design principles, engineers, good design principles, engineering and operating and maintenance practices. It is possible to have a good design, but if you don't have a good operating and maintenance practices, you are likely going to have issues. Process safety deals with prevention and controls of events with potential release or to, uh, with the potential to release hazardous material or energy. And such releases can result in so many things. And we are going to go through a few examples shortly. Can result in fire and explosion, toxic effects, and also result in injuries or even killing so many people. So when you talk about uh, process safety, that is uh, how we look at it from a professional point of view. And what is a ma uh, major incident? It is an hazardous event that results in multiple fatalities or severe, uh, severe injuries. Yeah, you know, it, it can result in extensive damage to structure, installation, or plants. It's always a large scale impact on the environment. And I'll, I'm just going to give a few examples shortly. So when we have talked about process safety, major events, then we have what we call primary containment. A primary containment is a tank or vessel, pipe or truck, a rail car or other equipment designed to keep a material within it, typically for the purposes of storage, separation, processing or transfer of gases or liquid. You know, maybe a few of us might be having cup around us or maybe tea around us. Uh, you will notice that the cup is what we call the primary containment. The cup or the bottle, anything that you have that uh, substance is the primary containment. Now put that cup in a tray. And for one reason or the other, your, your hand just tip the cup and it, it spills. 
however, is in a tray. That tray is the secondary containment. Though the primary containment has been lost, but is the, the secondary containment is already in place in, to avoid that uh, T going elsewhere. So what is loss of primary containment? That is when you have an unplanned, uncontrolled release of any material from this primary containment. And that, can, that will include toxic or non-flammable materials. You know, so we want to as much as possible for process safety purposes to avoid loss of primary containment. You know, so a uh, process safety event is when you have loss of primary containment. And like I mentioned, secondary containment is that environment they are impermeable physical barriers specifically designed to mitigate the impact of materials that have that have breached their primary containment. You know, so they 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 they, they are. I mean, if you look at tank farm for oil and gas, you will see the tank farm being in another enclosed uh, cage. Uh, I mean, and uh, uh, another place we call it dike or 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 uh, or bams. So when you have a spill from that tank, it will go into that dike so that at the end of the day, uh, you don't have that oil going somewhere else. That is the secondary containment. But anytime you have loss of primary containment, it is a big, big issue, uh, particularly in a flammable uh, oil and gas particularly. And that is why we want to go through a few examples that we have seen in the past. And many of us, I believe, I mean, all of us are in the UK, for example, and uh, you, you, you must have heard about this Papa Alpha. And um, so this is, uh, from the definition I have given, it is a major, it was a major event that actually had a lot of impact. Papa Alpha was an oil platform located in the North Sea. It began in product, I mean, production in 1976 initially as an oil and gas platform only, but later they converted it uh, to hard gas production. Unfortunately, on July 6, 1988, an explosion resulting, uh, an explosion and resulting oil and gas fire destroyed Papa Alpha and killing 167 men, 167 men. Like I told us, it's a low likelihood and high consequence event. Not just killing, the Papa Alpha itself was consumed to the ground. Everything was burned and melted by the fire that was coming out. And what about the pollution? It was also there, it came with that. That is why we call it a major incident. The accident was the worst offshore oil disaster in terms of life loss and industry impact. That changed a lot of things up thereafter. And like I mentioned, it was a low likelihood and high consequence event. But there have been a number of things or other PSC events that have taken place over the years. In 2003, you have Shuan National, National, I mean, natural gas well blew out in China. That killed 243, 243, a gas blowout. You know, so when we talk about process safety, it is critical. As engineers, as you are hearing, if you are involved as a consultant or you are designed, you are in, a, in an organization dealing with process facilities, we need to design them with safety in mind. 243 were killed. What about Texas? Uh, I mean, uh, um, Mumbai, I not uh, platform fire in India, it killed 22 people. You know, apart from all the environmental and the uh, asset damage that you have, you know, in 2013, we have Guindao, uh, uh, Guindao uh, oil pipeline explosion. In China also, 62 people were killed. So I'm just planting this seed in us as engineers that we can do more. We can also help our organization in designing facilities that will keep the, uh, uh, the, the primary containment in place. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that our design also is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is good enough. So uh, let's move on. Um, let's quickly look at some statistics. Like Dr. Moda showed us some statistics last time, and this is purely on process safety 
from IOGP. So you can see over the years, um, you can see the PSC uh, tier one and tier two over the years, and you can see the scale PSC per million work hours. And so at the end of the day, we really want to make sure that we don't have, we manage uh, our design and our operating facility, our, our operating practices to avoid this loss of containment, PSE one and PSE two. So uh, um, it, it is it is more for an engineer for us to really make sure that uh, we help our organizations to put safety in in all their designs. And here, I mean, as a result of these multiple PSC uh, tier one, tier two, that is a major incident that has been a major incident in the industry. There has been so many regulations for concerning process safety. In 1982, we have this European Cerveso Directive. In 1984, you have the Coma UK HSE uh, 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 that was released in 1984. APRIP 750 uh, was also uh, released in 1990. So all these uh, regulations is just to make sure that we don't have this major incident that will kill multiple people at the same time, not just killing, destroying the assets and destroying the environment. So as engineers, you have critical, uh, critical uh, uh, opportunity in order to help the world or help our our workplaces, as well as our, our society to make sure that we design with safety in mind. So let's, let's uh, dive, dive into where can we help us? Uh, I mean, where does engineering play into all this? Engineering, so we talk about two aspects of engineering, safety engineering. This deals with accident prevention, reducing risk uh, associated with human errors, Delivering safety benefits from engineered systems and design, engineered systems and design. Safety engineering also help us to control risk by reducing or completely eliminating it. Like I mentioned, the noise between an open uh, generator and an enclosed generator, you can see the difference. Uh, we call it silence, uh, I mean, um, um, the, those generators, uh, many of us might have seen uh, what, what I, I was talking about. Safety engineering also begin with design of that system in mind. In any, whether it is product development or something else, we want to put that design uh, into, into place. And uh, safety engineering also help us to develop intrinsically safe equipment systems or processes and facilities. That is why we, we put so much effort in that design as we uh, go uh, forward with uh, uh, in our various uh, workplaces. So as safety engineering, that is the focus, but safety engineers working with the, with the tools of safety engineering, what are they supposed to do? They need to consider a lot of factors while helping in the design process, you know, uh, that may affect the safety of a situation or a product, including design, technical safety, material reliability, legislation, and uh, human factors. Yeah, there are human factors, human error that we have to guide against uh, when we put any design in place. A safety engineer want to com uh, combine the uh, knowledge of engineering, of uh, engineering and of health and safety to develop procedures and design systems to protect people from illness and injury uh, and even from property damage, that is the essence of a safety engineer. And you might say you are not a safety engineer, but uh, you are adding value to that engineering system. And for them to really assure themselves that things are working well, they also carry out inspections and audits. So engineered safety includes fail-safe process equipment. Fail-safe, when, when they fail, they are failing safe or four tolerant equipment, fire safety features and enclosed as adult systems that prevent uh, exposure to both worker and the environment. These are uh, engineers, uh, the engineered safeguards include machine guards like the woman I showed us earlier. Those flying objects, we can put machine guards in such a way that it, those flying objects will not reach to our eyes. That is a machine guard or we have a rotating uh, uh, um, 
um, I mean, a rotating aspect of any equipment, you want to put machine guard so that people will not get caught with that rotation. You want to also make sure that uh, you select uh, less adults equipment, development of maintenance schedule and ensuring uh, equipment safety, audit and inspection procedures. These are all things that uh, we need to incorporate in our, in our design activities. So safe engineering design concepts include all environmental aspects of the workplace, such as lighting, noise level, atmospheric contaminants, ambient and localized temperature extremes, sleep resistant flooring. Imagine in your bathroom, that bathroom is equipped with a tile or tiled, and the tile is smooth, so smooth that whenever you have water, you are going to sleep and fall. You don't want that. Sleep resistant flooring. In our workplace, are we having sleep resistant flooring? An engineer needs to pick that up. Emergency escape routes. In case there's an issue, how do you escape from that environment? You know, fire suppression systems, you want to have that in place. Uh, so that in case there is fire, they quickly act and they are putting the fire off. I'm, um, uh, I'm just uh, about to round up. I hope I still have some time. Um, yeah, we should be looking to speed up. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is uh, like second to the last slide. Okay. So um, I'm just about to round up. So let's talk about uh, safety professional here. Safety professional is to help in anticipating, identifying, and evaluating uh, uh, hazardous conditions and practices. That is one of their function or scope of work. They are to develop hazard, hazard control designs and then methods, methods uh, procedures, and programs. That is one of their scope of work. They are to implement, administer, and advise others on hazard controls and hazard control programs. Like a, uh, from my profile, uh, and that was one of those things I was uh, focused with uh, when I was in OSCE. Uh, life saving role is quite critical in making sure that people go to work and come back safely. And the last one of that function is to measure, audit, and evaluate effectiveness of those hazard control programs. Without those, we can think that they are working and they may not be working. So um, let's. Um, Take a look at this uh, video, uh, if it works. Um, I hope it's going to work. Yeah. There is something for everyone. There is something for the odd ones out and those who fit perfectly in place. There are occupational hazards in many jobs. Working with machinery, chemicals, toxins, or in places that are high above or below ground can be especially dangerous. Employers are required by law to not only provide the safest workplace possible, but to properly train employees to handle on-the-job hazards responsibly. Health and safety engineers help companies understand and comply with safety laws, including fire safety and prevention. Some engineers deal with product safety. They work in manufacturing to ensure that designs of new products do not create unnecessary hazards. Engineers use a wide knowledge of mechanical, chemical, and human performance to analyze problems and create solutions. These are skills honed in college engineering courses and proved on licensing exams. Often travel is involved and there is a risk of exposure to unsafe conditions. Engineers might work for state or local governments or an individual company. Either way, the goal is the safety of the work environment and the products we all use. The need for health and safety engineers is ongoing, so it's safe to say this is a career with a bright future. So this is a career with a bright future. I just thought I should just uh, let us see that. Um, and you can see how it was uh, mentioned there. So this is my last slide, and uh, this is just so, um, what can you do to help? Because having talked about all these, educating us about safety and how safety should be approached as engineers, what can we do to help? 
You need to have situational awareness of your work environment. You need to make sure that uh, you, 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 you concern yourself about how can people working with me, people working in this organization, how can they go home safely every night? How can you contribute to that, uh, to that aspect? And also we need to use our engineering to help design safer workplace. I have emphasized this over and over again through my, uh, my presentation tonight. We need to help in that design, making safety part of that design. We need to use our engineering management skill to influence workplace for safety. Maybe you are not really in that uh, uh, practice of uh, uh, engineering, you are just managing. That's your uh, engineering management skill. You can use it to influence uh, the uh, workplace for safety by ma making suggestions on how safety can be applied. Uh, even as a consultant, you need to also put that in place. And uh, the, the next one talks about engaging health and safety professional to help with expert advice. Yeah, you might not have invested your career in health and safety, but people are around you that are safety professionals, you can as well engage them uh, to help in uh, designing or suggesting areas that uh, would be very helpful in making that workplace a, a safe place. And uh, of course, I talk about regulations. We can help influence regulations and the regulators uh, uh, to make sure that uh, we are having a society where we don't have impact of uh, these hazards that we know about, that we can design and control, and we are not doing that. But you know, in our position of influence and power, we can actually help in making our society a safer workplace. So I really want to appreciate uh, the, the time given to me tonight. Uh, so uh, we need collaboration. That is where we say, where is our own position in this puzzle. The puzzle is there out there, collaboration is needed. And when we collaborate, engineering skills, engineering management with safety professional, we can have a better workplace for all of us. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Odulami. Uh, I'm you, an engineer like yourself too. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know that you know that came across as a seasoned uh, professional, you know, in your delivery. So thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you. Just before um, to save time, let me just check: Are you able to see the chat? Because there's some questions there. Um, if oh, not, I, okay. I, can, I can read them out. But if if, if you yeah, if, I am able to see the chat. Okay. So then perhaps um, if, 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 I will I will allow you to first address those questions. I think there are about four. Uh, after okay. that, then um, we'll, um, I will ask for more, more uh, participants to ask. So please uh, attend to the questions. Please. Okay. Um, I'm here, uh, the one I'm seeing, Bond Wall, uh, a gentle reminder to, for you to post the questions. Okay, um, that's not the one. Are there truly functional process safety measures in place on diverse facilities in the Niger Delta and if yes, who is in charge of quality uh, and standard controls? The second one in the same question is, uh, okay, that's the first question. The second one is, is the enforcement of process safety standards in Nigeria on the right path, uh, both on the side of the government or private uh, 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 companies. Is DPR truly divide, uh, delivering uh, in terms of ensuring uh, safety process standards are uh, prepared? And the fourth one, are there contingency plans should safety process system fail? Example, please. Okay, let me start from number one. Um, unfortunately, uh, we, uh, I mean, this is now connecting back to our roots. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as if there are no measures in place. I worked for Chevron for 15 years. I work with DPR directly. Uh, for about two years when I was a regulatory affairs engineer. And, uh, you know, those uh, regulations are there to protect, but the enforcement is what we are lacking. And at the end of the day, uh, except, uh, you know, most companies in Nigeria are self-regulating themselves. 
they don't have they don't want to have the uh uh the the reputational damage that will come with a process safety event accident so they have to take care of themselves in terms of uh, monitoring by dpr dpr is doing their best from whatsoever i mean resources they have at their disposal unfortunately that is not enough and uh, we've been so lucky, I would say, but we have seen some pipeline explosion that have killed thousands and thousands, I mean, many people. And, uh, you know, it's quite unfortunate that we have to go through that, even when processes and those pipelines have been designed to withstand anything that you can, uh, you can experience, but people go and puncture, and before you know it, there is a source of ignition loss of primary containment. I've just uh, explained that. Whenever you have loss of primary containment for hazardous substance, the only thing you want to avoid is to get a uh, source of ignition and it will, it will uh, result into uh, an explosion. So uh, process safety measures are in place on diverse facility, but they, uh, each company and organization, they are more into self-regulating themselves, making sure that uh, they don't want to have the publicity that will go with an accident or event. So who is in charge of quality uh, and standards? I, I believe we have quality control organization in Nigeria. I don't know how effective they are, um, but for oil and gas, it should have been DPR along with, uh, I mean, NMPC is just a joint venture partner, but DPR is more for that. And with this uh, new bill or new uh, law uh, for oil and gas, hopefully we will have this more in a, uh, in a more professional fashion and uh, we will have better enforcement as we uh, go through this, uh, I mean, transitioning to this new, new law that have been passed for oil and gas. I, I, I hope I have answered that a bit. And then number two is, is enforcement of process safety standard in Nigeria on the right path. Uh, I think we can do better. We can do better for sure. And like I mentioned, possibly because of the self-regulatory uh, uh, way that the companies have been doing themselves, that is why you are not having big bank everywhere, but we can do better. When you have process safety, like I showed out in that triangle, PSC, I mean, tier one and tier two are lagging indicators, but if we focus more on tier three and tier four, we are likely going to avoid tier two and tier one, which are major, major incidents. And I believe that uh, um, with this new law that is really, uh, we are transitioning to hopefully, uh, both government and private part will begin to do their own part in making sure that people uh, working in a process industry are not impacted in any way. And number three is share DPR delivering in terms of ensuring process safety standard. I think I have alluded to that. They can do better. And with this uh, new law, hopefully that will strengthen uh, uh, them uh, as professional enforcement agency and people who design regulations and they can follow through uh, those regulations to make sure that uh, anyone that is going against it, they are penalized and they can do better uh, the next time. The number four I talked about is their contingency plan should a process system fail. Unfortunately, we can do better. I can't say that again, because uh, if it were to be relating to Nigeria, um, we have seen buildings uh, uh, in fire and uh, unfortunately they burn to the ground because <laughs> the, uh, the fire truck does not have water, we don't have fire hydrants, and then eventually the personnel are not there so there, 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 there are so many things that can uh, really uh, go wrong. Uh, while I was in Chevron, we, we had a uh, tank, tank, tank fire. Uh, unfortunately, because we are in an island in Escravos, we cannot, we, uh, though our internal capability did not really help. But at the end of the day, we had to call on uh, a joining uh, oil and gas uh, organization, Shell, and uh, those who want to come and help us. Uh, in that at that time, but that capability has been built over time uh, in order to arrest such in case it happened next time. So I mean, if as an organization they, they, they didn't take such uh, uh, steps, of course, when the next time fire will happen, there will be no help that may that may likely come in place. 
So uh, hopefully I've answered those uh, questions a bit and uh, we can continue to have that conversation as we go forward. And the next question, what are the consequences of not reporting accidents in oil and gas? Very much because the essence of reporting incidents, apart from taking punitive or any consequence to human that might be involved, is to learn. If you don't report those incidents, then how can we learn from them? Similar, go, go and look so many incidents over the years. You will see similar incidents happening over and over again because they were not reported or they were not investigated to the point of developing uh, 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 mitigation plans uh, so that we can avoid a recurrence. So there is uh, a lot to uh, gain from uh, by reporting incidents, you know. So, I mean, in your own organization, if that is the culture, uh, we need to really uh, intervene and make sure that we are uh, a reporting, we have a reporting culture in our organization so that everyone can learn from that. Uh, the next one talks about complaints uh, in the habit of not reporting accidents in order to avoid fines and sanctions of God from government agencies. Unfortunately, that might be true for some incidents, but some incidents you cannot you cannot cover it. You cannot there, when you have an explosion in a place and you are saying you are not reporting. Of course, that will get into the news. And then, of course, if if you have a strong regulatory body in Nigeria, you, you know the type of fine that you are going to get by, by not reporting. But there are uh, occupational injuries, one or somebody break a leg and this and that. Uh, that if they don't report it uh, to government, yeah, yeah. But if it was found out that that was the case, they're supposed to have every fine on such organizations. And that is why I'm saying in this new law of uh, uh, PIB, hopefully we will have a strong regulator that can enforce the law and that can find organizations for not doing their bid. Um, okay, so, no, Abby, um, let, Abby, let, me, let me just take you uh, on a question first and maybe others okay. want to speak. Then we'll come back to the chat box. Now, okay. I just got two, two questions, okay? Yeah. And I'm asking because I want to learn, all right? Okay. Now, the, the title of your talk, um, really struck me. So it's health and uh, safety in uh, the 21st century. Okay. Yes. And I was listening very attentively, hoping to see things like um, technology uh, advancement in, in, in health and safety, like things like BEAM, things like Industry 4.0. Now we're going to 5.0 and so on. But you, you seem not to have really touched on that. So my, my question is is it. Um, a, ref a reflection of where we are in the industry that, that we're not implementing high level technology uh, in, in Nigeria or where you're operating or it just it just something you just omitted from this presentation. That's question number one, right? Okay. Question number two, you showed the diagram that was showing the hierarchical control that had mm -hmm. PPE as the last, as the least most effective of all the control measures there, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder whether that hierarchical structure will always be the same in every context because I have a context that I that that puts that changes that that sequence that order, you know. So I wanted to be sure that uh, is it out of place uh, to have that sequence altered or it must follow that sequence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, on your first question about uh, the evolution of safety system in our current dispensation. Um, I was thinking to give a basic approach and uh, that does not mean there are no uh, such efforts uh, within safety professional. Um, obviously, uh, if I were to have made that my focus, I would have uh, talked more on that. Um, for sure, um, we have technology in helping uh, in managing safety at, at this time. And uh, those technologies also follow this basic education I have given tonight. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, no matter the technology whatsoever you have, if they don't follow this basic uh, approach, they are not likely going to give you the, 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 the uh, benefits uh, from whatever you might have implemented. So. For me, I thought, let me go basic first, 
And then, uh, I mean, um, if there are future opportunities, we can now zero in uh, on how we can use this basic to achieve the uh, I mean, technological approach. Uh, it's like, uh, I mean, it was, it's going to be garbage in, garbage out if you don't uh, uh, really understand the trend and the basic uh, foundational uh, safety approach. You know, so that was my my the, the way I, I I I connected with this. If I have been brief, that that is going to yeah, I chose the topic, but uh, <laughs> I chose the topic, but uh, that, that was not my focus. On your second question um, about uh, um, the hierarchical control, that has been uh, <laughs> I mean best practice or tested over the years. Um, I don't know what you have in mind that will turn the uh, that triangle around. All that we are saying is that uh, when you want to have controls in place, you really need to first look at the opportunity of eliminating the hazard. Is it possible to eliminate? Is it possible to substitute for the hazard? And then eventually, uh, uh, in terms of effectiveness, if I, uh, if I remove the hazard from any environment, I don't need to worry about it. Let me cite an example, working at height. I want to work at height. I know I have the potential to fall. Is there a way I can now avoid working at height and then work at the great level? If I, work, if I can succeed in that, I'd, I will not be open to falling, right? Elimination. So at the end of the day, uh, substitution, I have cited the example of chemicals. There are chemicals that are so hazardous that any, any inhalation from that, that can affect you for life. But can we have a substitution for such a chemical achieving the same outcome? So we are talking about hierarchical ineffectiveness. So at the end of the day, we come to the engineering controls. Can we design, can we design something that will make sure that uh, we are not uh, exposed to the hazard. I cited the enclosed and open generator, right? So it, that, these are things that have been tested over the years. And, and whatever you have in mind, I don't know whether it will turn the triangle. No, I hope no, I've answered me, your question. No, no, there's, this, there's this research I did and it was reversed, you know, in terms of the, the PPU was more- I'm not talking about- yeah, I'm not talking about incidents, uh, the number of incidents, yeah, yeah. because if you are talking about safety triangle, that is totally different. Don't worry. I, am... I, 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 will, I will speak to you as, after outside this meeting, okay? So okay. can we just have um, um, one question from the audience, then one from the, the, the chat box? The so chat, okay. Uh, yeah. One question, any, anybody at all? Like, I, I can't see any hand. Is there any hand? Um, I, 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 just want to, I just want to add to that uh, hierarchy on, of control. So. Um, Actually, I think that model, um, I, I would also be with them or don't like me on this one um, because it's, it's just like, I don't see how PPE can replace um, elimination because when you eliminate, you've taken away, there's no hazard. So you don't need anything to protect. No, 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 PPE, no, 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 let me be clear. But, I, let yeah. me be clear, okay? I, I wasn't saying that elimination, substitution, engineering, uh, nothing wrong with that. What I'm saying is that I did a study, okay, where I implemented PPE and I also implemented administrative control, okay? Mm. In this case study where I was looking at air pollution, okay, where, for example, you, you rotate the, the, the personnel that, that are in the um, uh, polluted area. So maybe change your shift pattern. Instead of staying 12 hours straight, Move, uh, move, move them every three hours, every five hours. Okay, the impact of the pollutants on the on the on, on them was was heavy. But when they wore PPEs like masks, right, they were um, uh, pre uh, protected. So if I had to, to were to relate to this hierarchy now, that no. means PPE will come higher than administrative no, control. I I understand, so where, it, so I, no, 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 wait, I understand where you're coming from, yeah, so but it, you see, the lower you come on the hierarchy, best practice recommends that you use, you, you use, once you go beyond substitution, best practice recommends that you use more than one, a combination of more than one control. Ah, a combination of all exactly. these. Exactly. So administrative control. <laughs> so even when you're rotating people, 
Because I want yeah, to you are not giving them MVP. Yeah, you still you're need not to give them MVP. MVP. That's 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 a wrong way of assessing. It's just like COVID. You do two <laughs> meter distance with face mask. You see. So you so so yeah. Anyway, yes. <laughs> Yeah, that, thank you for that response. Uh, and I will support you on that. There is no way, uh, I mean, from your ex experiment, you are exposing people to pollutants and then you are not giving them PPE just to see whether you can reverse. I think, uh, I mean, that that's, uh, you can't do that. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a combination that you have to use at that point in time. Is there any other question from the audience? I, I can see a hand up, uh, Yakubu. Uh... Yeah, thank you. Uh, I am calling from Nigeria, Oshu State, precisely. Okay. Uh, I so much love the presentation, but what I'm thinking is that I think all about safety and the standard being implemented, as far as my country is concerned, it's all about execution, implementation. We have the standard, but when you go to a country where the standards are not followed, so anybody does whatever he likes, so what I'm thinking is that all bound, like people that are there in UK now, you know that if your car is smoky, you don't drive out because definitely you know that they will arrest you. But in a situation when your car is smoky here yeah, and you can still give somebody money and pass by. So all these standards, it is implementation that matters. We have standard working. Like in industry, in universities, everybody understand what is called safety. We've been ready, reading books, lectures upon lectures. But when there is no implementation, so how do how does it work? So somebody was asking in the in, in the question that okay, is DPR the control measure? Are they are they? It's not the DPR. Everything boys boys about government wants this these safety rules to be implemented in Nigeria as it is done outside the country. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um... Yeah, uh, implementation can be good, but what I also am advocating for is enforcement. Enforcement. So uh, when you have an enforcement and somebody is not using it, there must be uh, uh, a repercussion for not or for violating that. But we don't have the enforcement and we are not penalizing people for violating a simple safety uh, aspect. Yeah, Mr. Engineer Lutola Pakende, I think he's sitting his hand. Good evening, everybody. So, sorry I'm late. Uh, I've, been waiting, I've been working uh, very tirelessly, so I fell asleep. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, when, I, when I just came in and I saw this, uh, and we were talking of Nigeria. Uh, <sighs> Is the, my problem is, um, like you said, sir, is implementation. And how do we get to that kind of a situation? You know, because from this hierarchy of controls, we find out from the lowest peak, which is the dangerous area, we are in trouble there. So what are we going to do? Like um, when, I, when I went to Nigeria, I was, I was with the best university where my chairman was there. And, um, I was going to take uh, my students to the, um, there was a building that was going on at that time. I said, I wanted to go and let them see, most especially PPE. I was telling them more about PPE. And I said, I wanted them to go and see how it is done, uh, the way they, they dress at that building site. Oh my God. The first thing when I got, when I met the engineers, I want to bring my students to this place. He said, go and bring them. I said, what? He said, yes, go and bring them. I said, is that it? Is that how you, you just admit people into your, into your construction site? That one shocked me because in the first place, you didn't ask me about uh, risk management, risk control. You didn't tell me what and what about the site. And he said, just go and bring them. And when I brought these students the following day or so, I told the students, I said, sorry, I'm taking you there on 50-50. If you mess up there and you, you got injured, you're in trouble, you're on your own. You know, I told them from beginning. So don't say it is me. So, and I just want you to go and see the PPE in, in this place. When I brought the students there, the engineer said, take them in. I said, take them in just like that. There is nothing 
to tell me about the safety in that place. And I took them there, I just told the students, make sure I, I follow them so that they don't play around and all that. So when they came back, the engineer said, do you have anything for them? He said, let them ask questions. Everything is, the whole thing is just, I don't know. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a three-story building. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a hostel, three-story building hostel. And nobody had any PPE on, all the workers. Mm. Yeah. On mm. university sites. Yeah. <laughs> so what are we saying? All these mm. are just show face in Nigeria. Mm. Mm. But I what mean, is wrong with us? When are we mm. going to get there? That's my question. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the fact is, uh, it could be a journey, but that journey, many have left us behind, unfortunately. Um, I mean, for sure, um, taking students to a construction site, there could have, should have been a safety briefing and then something for them to understand that uh, there are hazards in this place. And um, I mean, for sure, PPE is the least they can have going there. And since they are not working, so it's, it's for sure. But where is the, uh, the, the, the city, the university administrator, do they, I mean, the university itself, do they have safety department that goes around this country uh, construction site? How much are these contractors influenced in implementing safety in their own construction site? When we don't have all these, then of course, uh, everybody does anything anyhow. Uh, we thought, I thought that university and then having a safety, uh, I mean, a safety department that would oversee some of this construction is a high time that would put that in the, in the university administration. So, I mean, if somebody gets there and something fall on the student and that, I mean, the student had to go to the, to the hospital, who pays for that? Who pays for yes. that? So I, I believe, as you have said, sir, it's a journey but we need to move quickly. Okay. And all of you, are, uh, I mean, all of you listening to me tonight, like I mentioned, we can influence. We are hearing this as education, but we can influence one way or the other. It might not be everywhere, every time, but let's start small from our own uh, sphere of influence. And uh, before you know it, it can receive attention and it can expand over time. Well, okay. if you thank say, you. yeah. Thank uh, you, Dulami. Yeah, you know, because, I'm going to time. just uh, give up. And uh, you, uh, we want miracle. It may not, it may not happen. But Dulami, please, because of time, I just have one hand I cannot refuse. It's our past president. Okay. I will just need to call him. After that, we will we'll close this session with a vote of thanks. Uh, to you. Okay. Move <laughs> please. Past president, sir. Thank you very much, my dear chairman. Uh, correlations, um, as well as uh, I'm glad to be back. We have been, I got in a bit late, maybe 15 minutes, uh, actually being in transit. But I can see my friend and brother, Engineer Adebaju. We just, we just left one Zoom meeting that lasted three hours or so. Uh, I'd like to correlate the guest speaker, Engineer Dulami. That's a good one. And um, I, I also, I'm also happy his conclusions just now. Uh, the message is that in our little corners, we should do whatever we know it is right. In ethics, in safety, and all of that. But if you look at the magnitude of the problem in Nigeria, you are likely to want to join them. But let's continue to do our own bit. Now, what I know, and we all know is that it's, it's only in the private sector the major private sector. If you talk of a consulting firm, I'm sure if you get to out of Nigeria, you will see all that you need to see. If you go to all the oil, oil majors, yeah, you find all of that. You go to the multinationals, you find all of that. It is in the government circles, both institution and whatever, that everything goes. So this is where we as individuals, as branches, and then the Institute of Safety Professionals, I would love that Manchester branch can, as with Institute of Safety Professionals, 
uh, and uh, the division of uh, safety in NSC to do this often and probably bring engineer Dulami back on a larger scale. I am not particularly pleased with the attendance of um, NSC again, 34. This is the kind of thing that we should have hundreds. So let's, don't let's be tired. I'm sure some of us have keyed into this is I've said, let's do our bit. Let's escalate this to national level of the division of safety, the NSC national, and then we'll keep sending the message. The Cambridge Data Branch, congratulations. Guest speaker, well done. And thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, my chairman. Thank you, Mr. Yes, President. Odulami, that's our president speaking, though, so it's also your president. <laughs> Thank you. He has, he has spoken well, and uh, let's do a bit like the screen is saying, we need you as engineers to influence and to support whatever that can give safety, uh, particularly in Nigeria or even in our own area of sphere of influence. You might say you cannot do so much, but start first. A journey of 1,000 miles starts with a step. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, General Secretary, Dr. Irene, please, vote of thanks and uh, our special plaque for our, our, our great speaker today. Even though we, we, did, we have some, some, uh, some things to settle after, after this meeting. <laughs> Dr. Irene, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, just um, to add to the thank you note from our past president. Um, Thank you very much for your interesting and very detailed presentation on safety in the 21st century. Um, I think I like the blend of theory and practice which you demonstrated in your presentation. And this presentation truly uncovered the important role of everyone, including employers, employees, and engineers in the area of safety. Um, so I just want to say, Engineer Dulami, thank you for honoring our invitation. I will look forward to more collaborations. And to, to all our participants, um, I would just like to express my appreciation to you all uh, for attending this session. And we hope that you continue to attend our events. So I'll pass on to Dr. Akilu to speak about the plaque. Dr. Akilu about the plaque no 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 what? What? if we normally we give um plaques to our speakers and uh, so plaque certificates oh we have to upgrade this one to plaque because of the the, the, the quality of the presentation <laughs> no <laughs> either way either way but uh, we have something for you um 